Night, Chapter 3, by Eli Wiesel The beloved objects that we had carried with us from place to place were now left behind in the wagon, and with them, finally, our illusions. Every few yards there stood an SS man, his machine gun trained on us. Hand in hand, we followed the throng. An SS came towards us, wielding a club. He commanded, men to the left, women to the right. Eight words spoken quietly, indifferently, without emotion. Eight simple, short words. Yet, that was the moment when I left my mother. There was no time to think, and I already felt my father's hand press against mine. We were alone. In a fraction of a second, I could see my mother and my sisters move to the right. Zipporah was holding mother's hand. I saw them walking further and further away. Mother was stroking my sister's blonde hair as if to protect her, and I walked on with my father with the men. I didn't know that this was the moment in time and the place where I was leaving my mother and Zipporah forever. I kept walking, my father holding my hand. Behind me, an old man fell to the ground. Nearby, an SS man replaced his revolver in its holster. My hand tightened its grip on my father. All I could think of was not to lose him, not to remain alone. The SS officers gave the order, form ranks of five. There was a tumult. It was imperative to stay together. Hey, kid, how old are you? The man interrogating me was an inmate. I could not see his face, but his voice was weary and warm. Fifteen. No, you're eighteen. But I'm not, I said. I'm fifteen. Fool. Listen to what I have to say. Then he asked my father, who answered, I'm fifty. No. The man now sounded angry. Not fifty. You're forty, do you hear? Eighteen and forty. He disappeared into the darkness. Another inmate appeared, unleashing a stream of invectives. Sons of bitches, why have you come here? Tell me why. Someone dared to reply. What do you think? That we came here of our own free will? That we asked to come here? The other seemed ready to kill him. Shut up, you moron, or I'll tear you to pieces. You should have hanged yourselves rather than come here. Don't you know what was in store for you here at Auschwitz? You didn't know in 1944? True, we didn't know. Nobody had told us. He couldn't believe his ears. His tone became even harsher. Over there, do you see the chimney over there? Do you see it? And the flames, do you see them? Yes, we saw the flames. Over there, that's where they will take you. Over there will be your grave. Do you, you still don't understand? You sons of bitches, don't you understand anything? You will be burned, burned to a cinder, and turned into ashes. His anger changed into fury. We stood stunned, petrified. Could this just, could this be just a nightmare, an unimaginable nightmare? I heard whispers all around me. We must do something. We can't let them kill us like that. Like cattle in the slaughterhouse, we must revolt. There were among us a few young, tough young men. They actually had knives and were urging us to attack the armed guards. One of them was muttering, Let the world learn about the existence of Auschwitz. Let everybody find out about it while they still have a chance to escape. But the older man begged their sons not to be foolish. We must not give in, we mustn't give up give up hope even now as the world sword hangs over our heads so taught our sages the wind of revolt died down we continued to walk until we came to a crossroads standing in the middle of it though i didn't know it then dr mangala the notorious dr mangala he looked like the typical ss officer a cruel though not an intelligent face, complete with a monocle. He was holding a conductor's baton and was surrounded by officers. The baton was moving constantly, sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. In no time I stood before him. Your age, he asked, perhaps trying to sound paternal. I'm 18. My voice was trembling. In good health? Yes. Your profession? Tell him that I was a student? Farmer, I heard myself saying. This conversation lasted no more than a few seconds. It seemed like an eternity. The baton pointed to the left. I took a half step forward. 
I first wanted to see where they was in my father, where we where he had to have gone to the right, I would have run after him. The baton once more moved to the left, a weight lifted from my heart. We did not know as yet which was the better side, right or left, which road left to prison and which to the crematoria. Still, I was happy. I was near my father. Our procession continued slowly to move forward. Another inmate came over to us. Satisfied? Yes, someone answered. Poor devils, you are headed for the crematorium. He's be telling the truth. Not far from us, flames, huge flames were rising from a ditch. Something was being burned there. A truck drew close and unloaded its hold. Small children, babies. Yes, I did see this with my own eyes. Children thrown into the flames. Is it any wonder that ever since then sleep tends to elude me? So that was where we were going. A little further on, there was another larger pit for adults. I pinched myself. I, was I still alive? Was I awake? How was it possible that men, women, and children were being burned and that the world kept silent? No, all this could not be real. A nightmare, perhaps. Soon, I would wake up with the start in my heart pounding and find that I was back in the room of my childhood with my books. My father's voice tore me from my daydreams. What a shame, a shame you did not that you did not go with your mother. I saw many children your age go with their mothers. His voice was terribly sad. I understood that he did not wish to see what they would do to me. He did not wish to see his only son go up in flames. My forehead was covered with cold sweat. Still, I told him that I could not believe that human beings were being burned in our times. The world would never tolerate such crimes. The world? The world is not interested in us. Today, everything is possible, even the crematoria. His voice broke. Father, I said, if that's true, then I don't want to wait. I'll run into the electrified barbed wire. That would be easier than a slow death in the flames. He didn't answer. He was weeping. His body was shaking. Everybody around us was weeping. Some, someone began to recite Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. I don't know whether during the history of the Jewish people men have ever before recited Kaddish for themselves. Yigsal Vishkadash Rabbah. May his name be celebrated and sanctified, whispered my father. For the first time I felt anger rising within me. Why should I sanctify his name? The Almighty, the Eternal and Terrible Master of the Universe chose to be silent. What was there to thank him for? We continued our march. We were coming closer and closer to the pit, from which the infernal heat was rising. Twenty more steps. If I was going to kill myself, this was the time. Our column had only some fifteen steps to go. I bit my lips so that my father would not hear my teeth chattering. Ten more steps. Eight. Seven. We were walking slowly as one follows a hearse. Our own funeral procession. Only four more steps. Three. There it was now, very close to us, the pit and its flames. I gathered all that remained of my strength in order to break rank and throw myself onto the bar barbed wire. Deep down, I was saying goodbye to my father, to the whole universe, and against my will. I found myself whispering the words, May his name be exalted and sanctified. My heart was about to burst. There, I was face to face with the angel of death. No, two steps from the pit, we were ordered to turn left and herded into barracks. I squeezed my father's hand. He said, Do you remember Mrs. Shader on the train? Never shall I forget that night, the first night in the camp, that turned my life into one long seventh night, seven times sealed. Never shall I forget that smoke. Never shall I forget the small faces of the children whose bodies tra I saw transformed into smoke under a silent sky. Never shall I forget the flames that consumed my face forever. Never shall I forget the nocturnal silence that deprived me for all eternity of the desire to live. Never shall I forget those moments that murdered my God and my soul and turned my dreams into ashes. 
Never shall I forget those things, even were I condemned to live as long as God himself. Never. The barrack we had been assigned to was very long, on the roof, a few bluish skylights, I thought. This is what the antechamber of hell must look like. So many crazed men, so much shouting, so much brutality. Dozens of inmates were there to receive us, sticks in hand, striking anywhere, anyone, without reason. The orders came. Strip. Hurry up, boss. Hold on only to your belt and shoes. Our clothes were to be thrown on the floor of the barrack, at the back of the barrack. There was a pile we were all ready. New suits, old ones, torn overcoats, rags. For us it meant true equality, nakedness. We trembled in the cold. A few SS officers wandered through the room, looking for a strong man. Strong men. If vigor was that appreciated, perhaps one should try to appear more sturdy. My father thought the opposite. Better not to draw attention. We later found out that he had been right. Those who were selected that day were incorporated into the Sonder Commando, the commando working in the crematoria. Bella Katz, the son of an important merchant of my town, had arrived in Birkenau with the first transport, one week ahead of us. When he found out that we were there, he succeeded in slipping us a note. He told us that having been chosen because of his strength, he had been forced to place his own father's body into the furnace. The blows continued to rain on us. To the barber, belt and shoes in hand, I let myself be dragged along to the barbers. Their clippers tore out our hair, shaved every hair on our bodies. My head was buzzing, the same thought surfacing over and over, not to be separated from my father. Freed from the barber's clutches, we began to wonder about the crowd, finding friends, acquaintances. Every encounter filled us with joy. Yes, joy. Thank God you are still alive. Some were crying. They used whatever strength they had left to cry. Why had they let themselves be brought here? Why didn't they die in their beds? Their words were interspersed with sobs. Suddenly, someone threw his arms around me in a hug. Yihel, the Segeter, Rebe's brother. He was weeping bitterly. I thought he was crying with joy at still being alive. Don't cry, Yihel, I said. Don't waste your tears. Not cry. We were on the threshold of death. Soon we shall be inside, don't you understand? Inside. How could I not cry? I watched darkness fade through the bluish skylights in the roof. I was no longer afraid. I was overcome by fatigue. The absent no longer entered our thoughts. We spoke. One spoke of them. Who knows what happened to them? But their fate was not in our minds. We were incapable of thinking. Our senses were numbed. Everything was fading into a fog. We no longer clung to anything. The instincts of self-preservation, of self-defense, of pride had all deserted us. In one terrifying moment of lucidity, I thought of us as damned souls wandering through the void. Souls condemned to wander through space until the end of time, seeking redemption, seeking oblivion, without any hope of finding either. Around five o'clock in the morning, we were expelled from the barrack. The capos were beating us again, but I no longer felt the pain. A glacial wind was enveloping us. We were naked, holding our shoes and belts in order. Run, and we ran. After a few minutes of running, a new barrack. A barrel of foul-smelling liquid stood by the door. Disinfection. Everybody soaked in it. Then came a hot shower. All very fast. As we left the showers, we were chased outside. and ordered to run some more. Another barrack. The storeroom. Very long tables. Mountains of prison garb. As we ran, they threw the clothes at us, pants, jackets, shirts. In a few seconds, we had ceased to be men. Had the situation not been so tragic, we might have laughed. We looked pretty strange. Mere cats, a colossus, wore a child's pants. And Stern, a skinny little fellow, was floundering in a huge jacket. We immediately started to switch. I glanced over at my father. How changed he looked. His eyes were veiled. I wanted to tell him something, but I didn't know what. That The night had passed completely. The morning star shone in the sky. I, too, had become a different person. The student of the Talmud, the child I was, had been consumed by the flames. All that was left was a shape that resembled me. My soul had been invaded and devoured by a black flame. 
So many events had taken place in just a few hours that I had completely lost all notion of time. When had we left our homes and the ghetto and the train only a week ago, one night, one single night? How long have we been standing in the freezing wind? One hour? A single hour? Sixty minutes? Surely it was a dream. Not far from us, prisoners were at work. Some were digging holes, others were carrying sand. None as much as glanced at us. We were withered trees in the heart of the desert. Behind me, people were talking. I had no desire to listen to what they were saying, or to know who was speaking and what about. Nobody dared raise his voice. Even though there was no guard around, we whispered, perhaps because of the thick smoke that poisoned the air and stung the throat. We were herded into yet another barrack inside the gypsy camp. We fell into ranks of five. And now, stop moving. There was no floor, a roof, and four walls. Our feet sank into the mud. Again, the waiting. I fell asleep standing up. I dreamed of a bed, of my mother's hand on my face. I woke. I was standing, my feet in the mud. Some people collapsed. Sliding into the mud, others shouted, Are you crazy? We were told to stand. Do you want us to get all get in trouble? As if all the troubles in the world were not already upon us. Little by little, we sat down in the mud, but we had to get up whenever a capo came to check if, by chance, somebody had a new pair of shoes. If so, we had to hand them over. No use protesting. The blows multiplied, and, in the end, one still had to hand them over. I had new shoes myself, but as they were covered with thick, a thick coat of mud, they had not been noticed. I thank God in an improvised prayer, for having created mud in his infinite and wondrous universe. Suddenly the silence became more oppressive. An SS officer had come in, and with him the smell of the angel of death. We stared at his fleshy lips. He harangued us from the center of the barrack. You are in a concentration camp in Auschwitz. A pause. He was observing the effect his words had produced. His face remains a mystery, a memory to this day. A tall man in his thirties came, written all over his forehead in a gaze. He looked at us as one would remember would a pack of leprous dogs clinging to life. Remember, he went on, remember it always. Let it be graven in your memories. You are in Auschwitz, and Auschwitz is not a convalescent home. It is a concentration camp. Here you must work. If you don't, you will go straight to the chimney, to the crematorium. Work or crematorium, the choice is yours. We had already lived through a lot that night. We thought that nothing could frighten us any more, but his harsh words sent shivers through us. The word chimney here was not an abstraction. It floated in the air, mingled with the smoke. It was, perhaps, the only word that had real meaning in this place. He left the barrack. The capos arrived shouting. All specialists, locksmiths, carpenters, electricians, watchmakers, one step forward. The rest of us were transferred to yet another barrack. This one of stone. We had permission to sit down. A gypsy inmate was in charge. My father suddenly had a colic attack. He got up and asked politely in German, Excuse me, could you tell me where the toilets are located? The gypsy stared at him for a long time from head to toe as if he wished to ascertain that the person addressing him was actually a creature of flesh and bone, a human being with a body and a belly. Then, as if waking from a deep sleep, he slapped my father with such force that he fell down and then crawled back to his place on all fours. I stood petrified. What had happened to me? My father had just been struck in front of me, and I had not even blinked. I had watched and kept silent. Only yesterday I would have dug my nails into this criminal's flesh. I had, had I changed that much, so fast? Remorse began to gnaw at me. All I could think was, I shall never forgive them for this. My father must have guessed my thoughts because he whispered in my ear. It doesn't hurt. His cheek still bore the red mark of the hand. Everybody outside. A dozen or so gypsies had come to join our guard. The clubs and whips were cracking around me. My feet were running on their own. I tried to protect myself from the blows by hiding behind others. It was spring. The sun was shining. Fallen five by five. The prisoners had glimpsed that morning were working nearby. No guard in sight. 
only the chimney's shadow, lulled by the sunshine of my dreams. I felt someone pulling at my sleeve. It was my father. Come on, son. We marched. Gates opened and closed. We continued to march between the barbed wire. At every step, white signs with black skulls looked down on us. The inscription, warning, danger of death. What irony. Was there here a single place where one was not in danger of death? Gypsies had stopped next to a barrack. They, they were replaced by SS men who encircled us with machine guns and police dogs. The march had lasted a half an hour. Looking around me, I noticed that the barbed wire was behind us. We had left the camp. It was a beautiful day in May. The fragrances of spring were in the air. The sun was setting. But no sooner had we taken a few more steps than we saw a barbed wire of another camp. This one had an iron gate with the overhead inspe inscription, Arbright Machfrey, Work Makes You Free, Auschwitz.